Hey everyone, Patrick Kennedy here with Microchip. Here to show you how to automate data movement with direct memory access or DMA in zero lines of code and zero CPU utilization. You can find links to the tutorial write-up, source code, hardware used, and app notes showing some other ways to set up the DMA. I went over the fundamentals behind the DMA features on newer PIC microcontrollers in a previous video linked on screen, so check that out to get an overview of what it is, how it works, and why it's used. Okay, so what we are going to do today is vary the brightness of this LED based on the position of this potentiometer with a couple of Curiosity Nano development boards with the PIC18F57Q43MCU. Now I know what you're thinking. Is this just another video full of empty promises and broken dreams? This guy talks big and then he's going to show me how to control a simple LED? What a chump! Well as with most things, it is the simplest examples that provide the key to understanding the fundamentals so you can apply them to your next design. The DMA is a powerful way to automate peripheral dependencies ranging from sensor interfaces to serial communications to waveform drivers. To highlight this, we will read the value of this potentiometer through an on-chip analog to digital converter, or ADC, where each conversion is triggered by a timer. The DMA will be set to transfer the sensor reading to a UART transmit buffer, with the UART triggering a DMA transfer directly whenever it is once again ready to transmit after all bits have been shifted out to the receiving UART. The receiving UART on the other chip will then trigger another DMA transfer to move the value of the receive buffer to the PWM duty cycle register every time a full byte is received. The PWM is hooked up to an LED so we can see how the changing the duty cycle changes the brightness of the LED. Okay, so first off, here's my hardware setup. I'm using two Curiosity Nanos with the PIC18F57Q43 microcontroller and a couple of wires. I'm also using these click baseboards, but a breadboard will do just fine. Links to the hardware and source code used here are in the description below. Okay, so to start off, connect the board to your computer's USB, open a new project in MPLabX, select your device, and name your project. Open the Microchip Code Configurator, or MCC, which will configure everything we need. Here I'm in the system module as that usually pops up first by default. Make sure the high frequency internal oscillator is set to the clock source. The default 1 MHz system clock should be fine here. Go ahead and add a UART, an ADC, and a timer peripheral to your project from the device resources pane on the left. First, let's set up the timer to trigger every 50 milliseconds by opening the configuration tab and messing around with some of these parameters. I went ahead and set the clock source to frequency oscillator, or FOSC divided by 4, and the clock prescaler to 1 to 64, which as you can see gets me pretty close to 50 milliseconds. There are other combinations of numbers that will get you here. Next, we will open the ADC window and set up timer 0 as a trigger source. We will also change the clock source to FRC, which is the internal RC oscillator for the ADC. This isn't absolutely necessary per se in this case, but I like enabling this since it is needed if you want to do any conversions in sleep mode. Next, in the UART window, make sure transmit is enabled and the baud rate is set to 9600. Next, I'll need to connect my peripherals to the appropriate pins. For my setup, I have the potentiometer hooked up to the pin A0 and the UART transmit wire on pin A3, so I'll connect both accordingly. Okay, so the final step here is to tie all of these components together using the DMA to transfer the ADC conversion every time the transmit buffer is empty. The DMA manager within the System Resources tab should help us with this. All we need to do is enable one of the DMA channels by checking the box. We then set the source module as the ADC and set the source region as an SFR since there is a specific register in the ADC peripheral that stores the conversion. I actually don't know the name of the register off the top of my head, so I'll pop open the datasheet really fast and find that section on the ADC. Okay, so this is a 12-bit ADC, and looking at the block diagram, there are some channels over here, some buffers up there, here's that conversion trigger we set up, there's that clock source, and here's the result. It's stored in ADRESH or ADRESL, which I'm assuming stands for AD result high and AD result low. Um, okay, so the result is 12 bits stored in a 16-bit register. It looks like right align is selected by default, meaning I'll want to start first with a lower result, or ADRESL. The fact that it's a 16-bit register means that I'll need to iterate over that space in memory to get all 12 bits, which is where the mode comes in. 
Checking out the DMA special function register map, it looks like I just need to increment up to the next space in memory to get the high byte in AD result high, or ADRESH. We then just need to define that the message size is in fact 2 since we are transferring from a 2 byte register. I'm ignoring the variable name, size, and address columns because those are only needed if the source module is a general purpose register or somewhere in non volatile memory, like flash or double EEPROM. It's also grayed out, so this appears to be a clue that I don't need to configure these. Okay, so now I want to put that ADC result in my UART transmit buffer. So I'll set the destination module as the UART and the destination region as SFR since I'm moving data to the transmit buffer. I don't exactly remember the official transmit buffer SFR name, but this U3 TXB register seems promising. I'm pretty sure the standard UART configuration accepts a single byte of data at a time, which I can confirm by navigating back to the UART. Yep, that looks right. So I can set my message size to one and set it to unchanged mode since it's a one byte register. Last but not least is the trigger source, which I will set as U3TX since I want to transfer bytes every time the buffer is empty. Now you might be wondering, why don't I just set the DMA trigger every time an AD conversion happens? I encourage you to try your own little experiment on this. But spoiler alert, the DMA in many cases will overwrite the buffer before the UART can shift all the bits out. Increasing the baud rate of the UART might work, but the method I've opted for is much more robust. Go ahead and hit generate code. Open up main.c and note that we have no code in the while one loop. If you want to see how the DMA is initialized, you can look at the MCC generated code as it's relatively simple. And then hit program device. Okay, so on to the second device. Go ahead and plug the second device into the computer's USB and unplug the first so you don't program that one on accident. Open a new project in MPLabX. And again, open up MCC and modify the clock source, same as last time. Under Device Resources, add the PWM and UART peripherals to the project. Open up the PWM window and make sure it's enabled with the checkbox at the top. Scrolling down, it looks like I can configure the alignment, frequency, and duty cycle. I'm okay with these default settings, so I'm just going to go ahead and leave them untouched. Although what's interesting is that this PWM module appears to have multiple output slices available. Navigate to the UART and make sure the baud rate is set to 9600 and that receive is enabled. Go ahead and connect the PWM1 output to pin F3, which corresponds to the LED on the Curiosity Nano. We will then connect the UART RX function to pin A4 in the pin manager. You might be wondering what in the heck all these other pins are, or at least I was. I went ahead and looked at the data sheet and found that the UART on this device has some integrated support for industry specific protocols like LIN or LIN for automotive, as well as DALI and DMX for lighting applications. So maybe after this I'll play around with those features. Heading into the DMA window manager, enable the first DMA channel, set the source module to the UART, and the source region as SFR. Looking at the source SFRs, I'm assuming that this U3RXB is the receive buffer. Again, the buffer is just a single byte, so the message size is 1 and the mode is still unchanged. The destination module will then be the PWM1 underscore 16 bit module and the SFR associated with the duty cycle. I'm not sure which one of these it is, so I'll just pop open the datasheet again. Okay, so going to the PWM section, we see that each PWM has multiple output slices like mentioned before and each one is set with a P1 register. Hmm, it also looks like there are programmable trigger sources for duty cycle and period changes. I definitely want that. Okay, so first we'll click here to check out the register. It's two bytes, so my message size will be two. If we head back to the SFR map in the DMA section, we can see I just need to increment up if I start on the lower byte, which is PWM1S1P1L. Now I'm sending the lower byte of the ADC result first, so I should similarly load the lower byte of the PWM period first. I'll also set the start trigger to U3RX so the DMA fires off every time the UART has received a byte. Okay, so we have the DMA manager set up, and one last thing I wanted to check is the PWM trigger source we stumbled across earlier when we were in the datasheet. Okay, so this block diagram makes it look like those registers are buffered. Hmm. Let's try this buffered period section. 
Okay, interesting. So these period registers are buffered and only get loaded when I set this LD bit that triggers a load event. I want it to be done automatically, preferably when the DMA is done with the transfer. Let's see what this PWMX LDS register is. Okay, so it's an auto load trigger source select. And it looks like I can set the DMA actually as, a, as an auto load trigger source. Interesting. So let's go back to the PWM window and open the register view. And I'm looking for that LDS register that we saw. Uh, da -da, here it is. Let's just click the drop down menu and set it to DMA1, which is the channel on the DMA that we've already enabled. Okay, so go ahead and hit generate code. Again, open up main.c, note that we have no code in the while one loop. Hit program device, hook up your hardware, and you're done. Just like that, we implemented an analog read, serial communications, and PWM control with zero lines of code and zero CPU utilization. Feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments below, or like and subscribe if you want to see more ways to improve your embedded system design. Thanks for watching.